I'm Mendy Minjares. I'm the clinical director of the Seattle Children's Autism Center and also the um, director of the Applied Behavior Analysis Early Intervention Program. Um, I'm going to introduce and then Liz, my colleague, who I'll tell you about in just a minute, is going to do um, a big chunk of our content tonight. Um, and then I'll be kind of coming back in toward the end with some comments about kind of a little bit of the history of the field, the current status, and kind of where we think the field is headed. Um, so Liz gave me some facts about herself today. I wish they were more, more interesting. So I'll t I'm going to try to spice it up because she didn't give me the real, you know, like the inside scoop. She gave me all the professional profile, which is what she's supposed to do. But, you know, um, I'm going to give you a few of those highlights. Um, so Liz has an undergraduate degree in special education um, with a cross endorsement in general education, which I think sounds very impressive. It means she's a very well-rounded and well-trained teacher. Um, and that's from the University of St. Joseph in Connecticut. She then had got a master's degree in autism and applied behavior analysis from the same university. Um, and she has had experience both teaching in the classroom and then also as a lead behavior analyst therapist designing and conducting ABA intervention plans. Um, for us here at Children's, she's really the, the brains and the muscle behind our ABA early intervention program. I oversee, you know, kind of all the components and the program at a high level, but Liz is really the one leading the way as far as developing the programming, developing the interventions, overseeing the therapists and so on. Um, so we are going to hear from her first about, you know, just sort of a we want this talk to, especially because it's going to be posted online afterwards, we want it to sort of live as a, a description or a definition of what ABA is. Because there's, you know, you guys probably have varying degrees of understanding of that yourselves. Um, but if you do have some, you know, background knowledge about what ABA is, which of course many of you will, um, you're also aware that there are, you know, a, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of miscommunication, there's even some controversy in the field of ABA. Um, and so we're hoping that this can, you know, like I said, sort of live or exist as a, what is ABA? So it's a nuts and bolts kind of a background is, is you know, a, a big portion of what Liz is going to go over with you guys. And then what are some of the challenges that the field faces? Um, and sort of what are our thoughts about some of those challenges? So that's where I'll sort of come back in a little bit more towards the end. Um, so I'm going to not take up any more time. I'm going to hand it over to Liz. <laughs> she's got her, she's mic'd up with her lapel. So she's going to go from there. And I'll see you guys in a bit. Okay. Thank you, Mandy, and thank you for everyone who is able to attend here physically and also who is live streaming with us. I'm very excited to be here tonight to talk to you about applied behavior analysis. Um, so to give you an overview of what we will be covering, we're going to start by looking at what is applied behavior analysis or ABA. We'll talk about a little bit about some of the basics, so some of those concepts and terminology that you'll frequently hear. We'll get a little bit into some of the applications, some quality indicators of ABA, and then we're going to finish by talking a little bit about the evolution of the field in some past, present, and future directions. So to start, what is ABA? So ABA is a science of behavior change. It is how we learn. And what the field has done has looked to identify and describe some principles um, that govern behavior change and learning for all of us. Um, so, so that's one thing to really um, emphasize is that this learning occurs for all of us regardless of our ability. So for example, a person is more likely to repeat a behavior if it's followed by a positive outcome. So think of, about it from the perspective of if there is a specific Starbucks location that makes your favorite drink, um, you are going to be more likely to engage in that behavior, to go to that Starbucks to get your favorite drink just the way you want it. Um, and so that learning is occurring whether or not you're really paying attention to it. When we're talking about the treatment of ASD, we're looking at how ABA principles can be used in a very intentional manner to create learning um, through different contingencies and things that we're going to talk a little bit about um, in just a moment. <clears throat> 
So here is the official definition of ABA. This comes from Cooper, Heron, and Hebert in 2009. So ABA is the process of systematically applying interventions based on the principles of learning um, to help improve socially significant behaviors to a meaningful degree. Um, and to demonstrate that the interventions that we're using are what is responsible for the change in behavior. So that's a, that's a lot of language, so we're gonna unpack that a little bit um, and talk a little bit about the defining characteristics of the field. So the first one is this word applied. And when we're talking about applied, we're talking about improving socially significant behavior. So thinking about the behaviors that are really meaningful for an individual, um, so things like helping them to use their words to get their needs and wants met, those types of behaviors. Um, the next characteristic is behavioral. So what we're looking at um, are behaviors in an observable and measurable way. And so we're gonna talk a little bit later on in terms of how we define behaviors, how we track behaviors, so that we can all agree about what we're looking at. The next characteristic is analytic. So um, this is when you might hear um, you know, the terms ex demonstrating experimental control. And all that means is that we are looking at um, whether or not the interventions we're using are what is causing the behavior to change and not something else. The next characteristic is technological. So for this one, I want you to think of a recipe. So our, the procedures and the protocols that we're using are written out in such a way that they are defined very, very clearly and in great detail so that everyone can be sure of what they're supposed to be doing. The next characteristic, conceptually systematic. So this refers to the idea that everything we're doing, the procedures we're implementing, are tied back to the basic principles of behavior that have been well-researched um, and proven to be effective across a large body of literature. Um, and we're gonna talk about what some of those basic principles are a little bit later on. The next one is effective. So this one um, is kind of telling you what it is right off the bat. So making sure that the behavior change is um, changed to a socially significant degree. So it was meaningful for that individual um, that it was changed in, in whatever way uh, we were trying to change it. And then the last characteristic that we talk about is generality, or you may have re heard it referred to as generalization. So I often like to tell parents that um, a behavior is really no good if an individual can only do it in one location with a certain set of materials or a certain group of people. Um, instead, what we want to happen, uh, have happen is that we teach a skill, we teach a behavior, and it lasts over time. We see it happening in other areas with other people. So we're saying that that skill has been generalized um, to other settings, to different environments, and again, um, and extending over time. So shifting gears and thinking more specifically in terms of how this relates to the treatment of autism spectrum disorders um, or other developmental disabilities is how we're using these procedures to help improve um, the core symptoms of ASD. And so what ABA is doing in those situations um, is uh, providing services that support learning and school. Oh, sorry about that, um, and skill development um, to help in a variety of domains. So for example, we might be working on teaching social skills, so greeting peers, sharing, maybe turn taking. Um, we might be looking at communication, so you often hear functional communication training. And that basically just means helping somebody to learn to use their words to, in order to get their needs and wants met. Um, play is another domain that we might look at teaching skills in, especially if you're thinking about an early intervention approach, because play is one way that we teach some foundational um, social behaviors in young children, things like joint attention, um, those sorts of behaviors. In addition, we might be um, teaching behavior skills, such as learning how to handle frustrating situations, like being told um, you have to wait for something that you really want. Those can be really challenging situations for, for individuals. Um, so we look at teaching waiting skills. That would be an example. 
Um, also looking at adaptive skills, so maybe um, toileting or feeding um, or dressing perhaps. Motor skills, um, whether those are fine motor or gross motor skills, and also some cognitive skills. So you might have heard um, things like teaching matching or teaching imitation. And while sometimes those skills can seem very basic, um, they're so essential for the foundation of learning. And they're, they're oftentimes skills that many typically developing individuals have acquired in a very organic and natural way just through their development, but are sometimes skills that we have to explicitly teach to individuals with autism spectrum disorders um, or other developmental disabilities in order for them to then be able to engage in more advanced types of learning. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out about this is that ABA is not a standalone treatment. We are consistently collaborating with a variety of other providers, whether that's a speech and language therapist, maybe an occupational therapist, maybe individuals who are other behavior analysts who have an expertise in an area like feeding or intensive behavior. Um, so that's, a, that's an important idea to keep in mind is that we are not the only ones in there um, providing this treatment, we're really working collaboratively um, with a variety of other professionals. So what is ABA? All it is is this relationship um, bet between behavior and the environment um, that govern behavioral changes every single day, um, and that's learning. So for example, um, maybe a child is tantruming in order to attempt to gain access to a toy, but in that moment, um, the individual does not give the toy to the, to the child. And so they learn that, okay, maybe the tantrum isn't effective in gaining access to what I want. Um, or on the flip side, maybe the child uses their words and asks really nicely for that toy, and the parent or caregiver brings them that toy, and now they've learned that they can use their words in order to gain access to what they want. Um, so th those are just a quick a couple examples of some of the learning. Um, and again, ABA is just systematically applying um, these behavior principles to purposely um, create behavior change in learning. So now that we've talked a little bit about what is ABA, now we're gonna start talking about um, some of the very basics of applied behavior analysis. So you're gonna hear us talk a lot about this three-term contingency, the ABC sequence. So the A stands for antecedent, and that means whatever happens right before the behavior that might cue the behavior or trigger the behavior. The behavior is just the response, and I like to make a clarification on this because oftentimes this is something that can be a little bit confusing. Sometimes when parents hear, oh, your child had a behavior today, that sounds bad, but in reality, behavior could be a lot of things. Behavior is me talking. Behavior is me raising my hand in the classroom. Um, so it can be a, a variety of responses. And then the C stands for consequence. And all that is, is whatever happens right after the behavior um, that either increases or decreases the future likelihood that that behavior will occur again. Um, again, I always like to mention that this word consequence, sometimes we hear it and it sounds like it's a bad thing, and that's not necessarily the case when we're talking about it within the framework of the ABC contingency. It's just whether or not the behavior is going to increase or decrease in the future. So here's a quick example for you. Uh, the antecedent is mom asks, what do you want? And the child responds, goldfish. And the consequence is mom gives that child the goldfish. So in this situation, um, likely what will happen is the child will use the word goldfish in the future in order to gain access to that favorite snack. So, um, now we're going to talk a little bit about how we utilize the ABC contingency to help teach skills and help teach individuals to learn. Um, and so really um, what these interventions focus on doing is understanding and altering those environmental conditions at, at different places within the contingency. So again, there are naturally occurring contingencies happening all of the time that result in learning. 
that's, um, but what we're doing specifically in the treatment of autism is controlling some of these contingencies. Um, and we're doing that to either increase desirable behaviors, so to teach skills by creating opportunities, or to help decrease undesirable behaviors. Um, so reducing um, disruptive or maladaptive behaviors, again, by understanding and altering the existing um, three-term or ABC contingency. Um, so there are three basic principles of applied behavior analysis. The first is reinforcement, and that um, means that uh, we are adding or taking away something from the environment that's going to increase the future frequency of behavior. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about this more when we're talking about teaching new skills that we want to see continue to occur. Um, and there's either positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. And again, sometimes those words positive and negative um, can ha carry certain connotations with them. But when we're talking about them within the context of the basic principle of reinforcement or punishment, all the word, all, all that positive means is an addition, whereas negative means the removal of something. So positive reinforcement adds a stimulus to the environment. And that word stimulus is just a fancy word to mean something. So maybe we're adding our verbal behavior. Maybe we're adding an item. Maybe we're adding some kind of activity or event or access to something. Um, so some examples that I gave were maybe saying, great job, or giving access to a preferred toy. On the flip side of that, negative reinforcement means that we're removing something from the environment, um, such as some kind of aversive situation. So for example, let's say that um, some siblings are playing together, and one of the siblings says, stop, I don't like that. And that gets that other sibling to stop their behavior, to remove that aversive situ situation. That would be an example of negative reinforcement. In contrast to that, we have punishment. And punishment means that we are decreasing the future frequency of behavior. And again, you're going to have either positive punishment or negative punishment. Um, so you're either adding something to the environment, such as saying no or stop doing that. Uh, that's making the behavior decrease. Um, or sometimes giving a timeout could be an example of positive punishment. Um, and then again, negative punishment would be removing something from the, st from the environment. Um, so maybe taking away a preferred toy or something like that. Um, I also like to point out that um, there are ethical considerations when we're using these types of principles within our treatments um, and intervention approaches. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, but just something to keep in mind um, that, you know, for instance, we're always going to try to use reinforcement first before we um, look at using punishment procedures. And the last basic principle is extinction. So extinction just looks at removing specific reinforcement that was previously available. So for example, if Robert was engaging in inappropriate attention-seeking behaviors, we would look at no longer providing that attention to Robert um, while, he's, while he's engaging in some of those challenging behaviors. Um, but again, what would be important to note about that is that if we're going to remove reinforcement for the inappropriate behaviors, we want to make sure that we're providing it for an appropriate behavior. And that's where you're going to hear us talk a little bit later on in terms terms of replacement behaviors and those things like that. Um, but the goal of extinction is that it's helping to decrease the likelihood um, that a behavior will, will occur in the future. Um, with extinction, sometimes you may um, hear or um, learn about an extinction burst. This means that a behavior might temporarily increase in intensity or duration. Um, so it, it's something that, again, there has to be some ethical considerations made around in terms of making sure that everyone feels comfortable with the procedures and that there's plans in place um, while, this, while this may occur. So now that we've talked a little bit about some of the basic principles, we're going to look at how that is applied um, in ABA.
So one of my very favorite things about applied behavior analysis is that although I have a love and passion for using it to help treat um, autism spectrum disorders, um, I think it's really cool that it is effective in a lot of different areas. And again, it's really something I like to point out to people and have them be aware of that ABA has been shown to be effective across a variety of different fields. Um, and this is not necessarily a comprehensive list of that. It's just a few examples, um, and I can point some out to you. So for example, um, organizational behavior management. Um, there are behavior analysts that will go into businesses or corporations and look at helping um, the company to design procedures that help employees or groups of employees maybe work more efficiently, um, which in turn might save the company some money, something like that. Uh, with health and exercise, there's been research done uh, to help individuals engage in um, things called contingency contracts or self-monitoring of their behavior um, in order to help them stay um, on track with maybe a, a new exercise regimen in order to improve their health. Um, in industrial safety, there has been research around um, helping to pro provide feedback to staff members in order to increase their safety awareness and their engagement in safety behaviors, um, which is obviously certainly important. Um, and then uh, another one, like environmental con conservation, um, there's been um, a bunch of research that has looked at helping to increase awareness around recycling using a variety of antecedent strategies, which we'll talk a little bit about what that means again, too, um, and looking at reinforcing people for engaging in those behaviors um, so that we're working towards having a more sustainable planet. So um, again, Oftentimes we hear ABA paired with autism, but it's not um, solely for autism. It just happens to be very effective in helping to treat some of those core symptoms. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot more out there in the world of, of ABA that's pretty cool. So um, jumping back in um, to what we would be looking at in terms of helping to um, treat autism spectrum disorder, there are, two, there are two different things that we would be doing, um, two main things that we would be doing. One would be looking at increasing appropriate behaviors and teaching new skills. The other would be looking at how we can help decrease challenging behavior. So when we're looking specifically um, at skill acquisition and increasing appropriate behavior, um, we are looking at just teaching new skills. Um, and we are doing that by purposely using cues to help signal when a behavior should occur. Um, and again, we're going to use this three-term contingency, the antecedent behavior consequence contingency, in order to be able to do that. So when we're talking about things like antecedent, we're asking ourselves, what's the child's or what's the learner's cue to engage in this behavior? Um, so there's some sort of instructional opportunity or situation or you know, visual signal somewhere in the environment so that they are cued to engage in the behavior. Um, we want to make sure that we're teaching the right behavior depending on what we're looking to do in terms of increasing or decreasing um, behaviors. Um, so we're looking at what type of response is required for that skill set. And then in terms of the consequence, we're going to be focusing on reinforcement, right? Because we're looking to increase that future frequency of the new behavior. Um, and again, that's going to be anything that is either provided or taken away that increases or st to strengthen and maintain that behavior in the learner's repertoire. So here's a quick example. Um, in this situation, the antecedent is that the parent and child walk up to a closed door, um, which is the cue. And then the parent prompts the child to say, open. So oftentimes, when we're teaching skills, there's going to be some kind of prompt or teaching strategy to help the learner engage in the correct response. Um, in this situation, they use the verbal prompt, open. Um, so the behavior, the response is the child says open. And the consequence is a natural consequence. The parent opens the door and they get access to what's ever on the other side. Um, so in this case, that increases the likelihood that the child is going to say open the next time they encounter a closed door, which means that learning has happened. 
um, which is very exciting. So this is just one um, kind of isolated, simple example. Um, but there are lots of different skills that we teach. And when we're looking at ABA interventions as a whole, um, there's, a, there's a broad continuum of intervention models. Um, and I, I like to emphasize this point because there's, there are, you're going to hear about structured intervention models compared to naturalistic ones. Um, and really, we should be thinking of those as tools in our toolkit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the differences between them. Them, but there's research to support that both are effective. Um, and again, it comes down to clinical expertise and collaborating with the team in order to determine what's going to work best for um, an individual. So if we're looking at a more structured approach, we're, um, these approaches are typically going to be more instructor-led. Instructor um, the pace will be controlled by the instructor, um, and they're going to present the opportunities for that learner to respond to individual learning trials. On the flip side of that, um, a naturalistic approach would have the have it be learner initiated, um, usually through requests or gestures um, for, for preferred items. So you know there's really good motivation for that individual to engage in the learning um, trial. With structured interventions, this is where you're going to see some more of those traditional sit-down sessions, um, and the the setting and environment will probably minimize distractions. Uh, whereas in a naturalistic setting, you're going to see that it, the learning is happening within the context of a variety of other activities that are naturally occurring. We're not necessarily limiting any distractions in the environment because we're teaching right where we would want the behavior to occur. With structured approaches, um, we're going to be using teaching materials that are, again, uh, teacher selected, and oftentimes the reinforcers that are used to increase the behavior um, are going to be unrelated to, to the teaching materials. Um, and that's contrasted with a naturalistic approach where um, lear the learning materials would be learner selected items, so you know there's um, potentially a high level of interest with those um, items. And those items can be used um, as reinforcement when you provide contingent access to them. Um, so to go a little bit more in depth on some of the structured models, some key characteristics are um, that oftentimes those skills are broken down into much smaller steps. Um, and uh, they frequently allow for repeated practice. So those trials are presented over and over again in a concentrated time period. Um, the trials, again, are not in a natural context, and the reinforcement is probably unrelated to the task. Um, so there's going to be some advantages, potential advantages and drawbacks to each type of model. Um, so some advantages of using a structured approach may be that there's faster acquisition rates, um, right, because they're getting that, that repeated practice with a skill, so they're getting lots of op opportunities to practice it and have it be reinforced. Um, some individuals learn better with more structured learning. They need those minimized distractions in order to be able to better attend to what they need to be doing. Um, and uh, oftentimes, structured models are going to have um, a very structured data collection procedure that's going to um, allow us to really closely monitor progress so that we can quickly make changes to intervention um, when they're warranted. Some potential drawbacks to these types of approaches might be that there's difficulty with generalization and maintenance of those skills, right? So if a child is learning a certain skill while they're sitting down at the table and not actually in the environment that we would be expecting that, um, there's, we, we need to make sure that they're generalizing that, and that might be a little bit trickier with some of the structured models. There might potentially be an increase in disruptive behavior. So if you had a child who maybe engage, engages in some non-compliant behaviors, um, trying to get them to sit down at a table um, might be a little bit more challenging for them initially. Or sometimes with that repetition of trials, there may be um, kind of a source of boredom of, of learning that way. So you might see um, some other behaviors for that reason. 
Um, and, and sometimes it might not always be developmentally appropriate, right? So if you're working with a really little kid, um, it might not make sense for them to sit down at a table yet. So some just considerations to keep in mind when you're looking at those uh, um, structured models, and there's a couple of examples listed for you. In looking at naturalistic models, um, some of the key characteristics um, are that teaching is going to be embedded in that natural environment, and the reinforcement is directly related to the task. Um, and it often incorporates a developmental perspective. So this is going to maybe be occurring during play, um, within the daily routine that the individual is already engaging in, um, and it's going to be child-driven or child-led. So some advantage of, advantages of this might be that this might better help facilitate maintenance and generalization of skills, right? Because they're learning to do the behavior exactly in the environment that they need to be able to perform it in. It also allows the child to stay in their natural environment. Um, and it facilitates greater parent and, um, and caregiver involvement. Um, and it can be easier to adapt to some developmentally appropriate activities. Potential drawbacks of this type of model um, may be that the, some children just don't learn as well in a less structured environment. Um, so that might be a little bit more challenging for them initially with a naturalistic approach. Um, and sometimes the data collection can be a little bit trickier um, with, um, some of the, within some of the natural settings. Again, there's some examples for you. Um, and, but again, to keep in mind that although there's advantages and disadvantages of each, we should really be looking at these as tools in our toolbox and really selecting what we think is going to be most appropriate for an individual and mon monitoring the data to make sure that we're being successful um, in helping to teach the behaviors. So on the flip side of kind of one of our main focuses um, is that um, when we're looking to modify inappropriate behavior, we're starting with what we would call a functional behavior assessment. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that um, behavior is not occurring in isolation, but rather it's occurring within a context of antecedents and consequences and all sorts of environmental variables. Um, and that, that these ABCs, these contingencies, are already hap happening and either trig triggering and or maintaining the challenging behavior. Um, so what we need to do is look at the relationship between all of these and see if we can find patterns within them in order to start to make some predictions about why we think the behavior is happening. Um, and, and when we're making some of those predictions, we're calling those hypotheses. So we're developing our hypotheses about why we think the behavior is happening. What is the function of that behavior? That's something that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Then what we do is we look at confirming or modifying our hypotheses based on uh, what we find from our assessments. Um, and then our next step is that once we're sure of uh, the function of a behavior, is that we're going to look at how we can make changes to the antecedents, the consequences, and some of the environmental variables that may be in place for that learner. Then we're going to look at teaching replacement behaviors. So replacement behaviors just means what someone can do instead. So what would be a more appropriate way for them to gain access to the reinforcement that they're seeking? Um, and in addition, looking at maybe teaching additional skills that help to support overall functioning. So oftentimes within the early intervention program, I'm looking at um, some readiness skills for children or what some of those learning behaviors they would need in order to be really successful with learning um, more challenging skills. So functions of behavior, functions just means why is a behavior happening? Um, and these are so important to look at because they're not always as obvious and straightforward as we think. So we really need to make sure that we're relying on um, closely monitoring those ABC contingencies in order to understand what is happening with the behavior. Um, 
And every behavior serves a function, and this is really important to keep in mind because the individual is engaging in that behavior because it's working for them. They've learned over time that they can maybe tantrum because they get their toy um, that they want, or they can maybe start crying because somebody's going to pay attention and provide um, some sort of, of reinforcement in that manner. There are four functions of behavior, um, but the caveat to that is that behavior can sometimes be a bit complex, so oftentimes there are multiple functions to a behavior. Uh, but to give you a brief example, attention is just what it sounds like, although I like to point out to parents um, during training that sometimes attention um, can be physical proximity to a child. Sometimes maybe a crossed arms or a certain look on our, on our face um, can serve as a source of attention for children because they know they're getting some sort of reaction out of us. Um, the tangible function would be some, they're gaining access to some kind of preferred item or event. So maybe they're um, gaining access to their favorite toy. Um, behavior can also be done in order to escape and avoid things. So to either delay having to do something that we really don't want to do or try to get out of something that we really don't want to do. Um, and then there's also this automatic or sensory function, which is something that um, we provide to ourselves that may, maybe feels good or has some sort of self-stimulatory component to it. Um, and it's so important that we're identifying these functions um, because they lead us to uh, design interventions that are really going to focus on the underlying cause of that behavior. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit in a moment about functional equivalence when we show you an example. Um, so in this case, um, the antecedent is another child in the classroom is presented with their snack. And the behavior is that the child that I'm working with goes and grabs that um, other friend's snack um, and eats it. And the consequence is that the adult that's working with them gives the child food to keep him from grabbing the food from the peer. So in this case, we're looking at a tangible function of behavior. Um, and that, that positive outcome, that them receiving that food, is going to maintain that grabbing behavior in the future. So if you look at the chart below, the inappropriate behavior is grabbing to get the food. Um, but instead, we need to teach them a replacement behavior. Um, and what's important about this is that we need to make sure that whatever replacement behavior we're teaching them is still getting them access to the food. That's what we're referring to when we're saying functional equivalent. So you know, another example is, you know, although I love my job, I get paid for going to work. Um, and if suddenly somebody was only going to give me a high five and a way to go Liz, um, that might not really do it for me. So it's the same kind of thinking or mindset with this. Um, if they want food in that moment, um, we need to be able to provide that same reinforcement to them. Um, and again, we're going to be modifying inappropriate behaviors by looking at our ABC contingency. So looking at some antecedent strategies, these are going to help us decrease the likelihood um, of the behavior occurring. So for example, in that last scenario, maybe we provide um, the child and his peers snacks at the same time. Or maybe we provide the child who is grabbing his snack first so that he's less likely to engage in that grabbing behavior. <laughs> we also um, would look at teaching different behaviors. Um, so there's a whole bunch of teaching strategies in order to do this. Um, but maybe we teach the child to point to the snack that they want. Or maybe they use a vocal request to ask for the snack that they want. And then we can reinforce that. Um, and then in terms of consequence strategies, this is where we would be differentiating our reinforcement um, dependent on how the learner is responding. So we're either going to reinforce the child when they engage in the inappropriate behavior, or we're going to potentially withhold that reinforcement if they're engaging in the inappropriate behavior. So in this scenario, if the child grabs the snack, we're going to withhold the snack. Then we're going to help them to use some sort of new communication skill to ask for it appropriately, and then provide them that access with the snack and maybe some attention. <clears throat> 
All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the quality indicators in ABA programs. Um, some, so some of these include clear treatment plans, goals and objectives, clear lesson plans, ongoing data collection, um, and database decision making. Um, and, and based on visual inspection, we call this visual analysis. So we're looking at the graphs and determining whether we're seeing the trends go in the direction that we're hoping. So it's also good for everyone to know that the field of ABA has oversight by the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. Um, so the BACB is who certifies us. Um, they have an ethical code um, that we have to be compliant with. They require that we are engaging in continuing education to make sure that we're staying current um, with the literature that's currently out in the field. Um, so, and there also is a large international influence as well too. There are a variety of professional organizations that hold conferences for us to help us with some of that ongoing training and learning. Um, and, but two um, big examples or common examples would be the Association for Behavior Analysis International and also the Association of Pro Professional Behavior Analysts. So looking a little bit more into um, the quality indicator of uh, clear goals. Um, so when we're talking about clear treatment plans, goals, and objectives, um, there's going to be a couple of things to look for. One is we're going to want to make sure that our target behaviors are operationally defined. We'll show you an example of that. Um, and that our um, goals are written in such a way that we clearly understand what's supposed to happen um, in good detail. Um, and that includes the component of having that master criteria so we know when a learner has met their goal. So an example of a clear goal would be something like when engaged in play with a toy and a play partner asks Jonathan for a turn with the toy, Jonathan will respond by relinquishing the toy within three seconds of the request. He will do so in 80% of opportunities across a minimum of 10 trials um, and three days. Um, so you can see there's a lot of language in that, but it really helps set it up so we know um, what the expected response is, how it should be carried out within what context. We know the accuracy that the child has to do that in, and we also see that there's consistency tied to the objective, and that's really important too. Um, so it's no good if, a, if somebody can have just a really on day and hit 80 or 90 percent and we would say, oh, they've got it. We really want to make sure that we're seeing that consistency across days and then checking in on maintenance later on. An example of an unclear goal would be something like, Jonathan will improve his ability to share with his peers. Um, so that word improve doesn't really tell us much. That could mean a lot of different things to different people. Here's an example of a program. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that programs have to look like this. It's more, um, more so important that there are some main kind of components or essential components that you, you should be able to see in the program. Again, they should be written um, in a technological manner, right? So kind of like that recipe that we were talking about before. So there's a lot of detail and it's very clear in terms of what needs to happen. Um, so you should see things about um, the teaching sequence, the prompting strategies, how feedback is, a, is provided. So if the child or learner responds correctly, we do this. If the child or learner does not respond correctly, then this is what we do, um, and so on and so forth. Here's an example of a data form. Again, these could look different, um, but you can see that there is a box for each skill that this individual is working on. Um, and there's a very clear and systematic way in which they're going, which the behavior technician would go about collecting data, moving through session types, so maybe collecting baseline data, being able to run errorless teaching trials, um, and then probing or testing to see how that errorless instruction was completed. Um, so again, these would be some, some kind of indicators to look out for. Um, in addition to, you can see that maintenance skills are being tracked within this data form as well too.
Here's an example of a data collection form. It's just a pretty straightforward um, ABC um, data form. Um, but here's an example of an operational definition. And anytime you have one of these definitions, you want to make sure that the target behavior is defined um, with some detail and that there are some examples and non-examples. So it's really clear in terms of what's included and not included. Um, but for the sake of time, we're just going to um, keep going. Here's a, an example of a graph um, where you might do some of that visual analysis. So you can see that the number one in the upper left-hand um, corner corresponds to the one under the current item. So that skill is teaching the child to follow the direction of cleanup. You can see that initially the child um, did not have that skill. They scored 0%. But then over just a couple of days, they've quickly acquired that skill, and there's that upward trend in the data. So this is what we're talking about when we're engaging in that visual analysis in order to determine whether or not learning um, is occurring and progress is being made. Um, so each of these examples has pretty quick acquisition rate. Um, the last one, number four, sit down, is a little bit slower, but you can still see that every time we're probing this behavior, um, we're seeing that upward trend and increase in the behavior. Um, this is another example for a different skill. Um, and this is a really great example of why visual analysis is so helpful to us. Because you can see that that first skill, sharing one of many items, um, initially the learner made a little bit of progress, but then they're starting to plateau. So what this visual analysis allows us to do is quickly make a change to the intervention and try something else in order to get that learning um, to increase. Um, by, by changing maybe the prompting strategy or changing something about how we're teaching the skill. Um, so again, that is a really important part of using that visual analysis so that we're not wasting teaching time. Um, so just in summary, uh, ABA is the science of how environmental variables um, can alter the behavior. Um, and these are impacting learning all the time. Um, and interventions are defined and tracked um, and tracking behaviors systematically and regularly with the application of applied behavior analysis. Um, so in, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to hand it over back over to Mendy so that we can talk a little bit about some of the past, present, and future directions. Okay. I'm going to use the mic because I like to pretend that I'm a stand-up comic even though I'm really not. <laughs> um, so that was a great overview of ABA. As we were going through it, I was thinking, wow, I didn't even realize how much we captured in a very short period of time that, that represents a field that the textbook is this thick for. So hopefully you guys feel like you just got a crash course in ABA because I feel like I did. I feel like I've all reintroduced to all kinds of things that we do every day but don't always articulate so nicely. Um, so I want to go now into, you know, we, we wanted to, in some ways this might seem a little backwards because we're going to give you, for example, some history in the field now that we've been talking about the field. Um, and, but we did that on purpose. And the reason is because we wanted first for you guys to just have an understanding of what ABA is and how we think about it, how we conceptualize it. Um, and so, so now we're going to, you know, sort of try to put it into context in terms of the bigger picture of the field. Um, so, you know, when, when we're thinking about past, present, and future, um, I, I think in general, it, it's helpful for us to, you know, kind of provide context. Like, why is this even relevant? Why is this relevant to the field of ABA? Um, and, you know, when we think about that in general, in terms of science or medicine or any kind of field where research is occurring, um, you know, all fields begin with initial discoveries, right? Um, all fields begin with somebody has a, you know, either accidentally comes across something, has a eureka moment, draws a conclusion based on something that has happened, and then they start to test that. So we don't start with perfect, right? We start with whatever, wherever we started. I mean, penicillin was discovered by mistake, right? Um, and, and that's very typical in science. And, and then what we do in, you know, in any scientific field is we progress, of course, right? So then we start to realize, oh, this might have value. 
you know, th this, this intervention is causing kids to learn skills, or this medicine is causing people to not be so sick. Wow, we better explore this some more. And so then we start studying it, right? We start researching it. Um, and so in the field of ABA, there's been an incredible evolution since those early days. And so we want to, you know, talk some with you guys about that and, and sort of what that progression has been. Because we certainly have many more tools available now than we did, you know, when the field was, was initially sort of born, if you will. Um, and we have much more flexibility in how we implement ABA interventions than we did kind of back in the old days, if you will. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about where we think the field is going. Because just like any scientific field, by no stretch of the imagination is our work done. By no stretch of the imagination is this field perfect. We haven't discovered everything there is to know. We never will, right? Um, and so kind of having a sense for where we're at and then what some of the next steps might be in terms of how we continue to evolve this science. Um, so again, Liz has mentioned a couple times, you know, that we have some, some ethical considerations in ABA um, and that the BACB has an ethics code that behavior analysts adhere to. Um, and, and I want to, you know, kind of touch on this for a minute because there, there are some, you know, some areas that the field has been challenged by in the past and there's a lot of ethics around that. Um, and I think people don't always realize, you know, you hear certain things or you're reading online and something doesn't make sense to you and you think, well, that sounds weird or why would you do that? Or, um, and I think that especially the general public and, and consumers of ABA don't always realize that there is an entire, you know, I don't know how many page document that outlines the ethics around what is our responsibility if we're going to use interventions to change the behavior of others? That's a big responsibility, right? I don't want that responsibility alone. No behavior analyst wants that responsibility alone. So there are ethical considerations that we rely on, and, and, and which is one of the biggest reasons that we rely upon science. This is not, you know, we're not pulling these principles out of the air and saying, hey, we think this is a good idea. There's really a body of principles and considerations in science that we're relying upon. So some of the ethical considerations, you know, that I think are most relevant when we're, when we're thinking about ABA, and, and this is a fraction of what's actually in the ethics code for behavior analysts, um, but you've heard Liz mention quite a bit about, you know, how the field uses data and how this is a science and how this, you know, there's been an evolution of this science and so on. So in the field of ABA, we, we don't ever use procedures that are not supported by research. In fact, it would be considered a, like a violation of a defining feature, if you will, um, for us to use a procedure that didn't have research to back it. So behavior analysts do not go rogue. That is, behavior analysts are like a straight and narrow crew. They are on the straight and narrow, they are following the path, and it is based on science. Um, and, and a big part of that is, again, the responsibility that comes with having an understanding of tools that are used to change behavior. Um, directly following from that is we don't just rely on past research to say, yeah, what I'm doing now is a good idea. We rely on actual data that what I'm doing now works with this person in front of me that I'm working with. So, you know, I oftentimes say when I'm teaching parents, we never go based on our impression in ABA. You should never hear a behavior analyst say to you, well, I think the child is doing better, or yeah, it seems like it's going well. Like, these are not scientific words, right? This is your opinion, this is your impression. Um, but if we're gonna make decisions about treatment in ABA, what we're gonna do it based on is proof, essentially. I, wa I wanna see, uh, you know, how many times did you do this behavior today? How, what were the antecedents that led up to this challenging behavior? Um, and I'm gonna rely on those data, those graphs that Liz showed us, for example, to make my decisions about what to do next. Because then I can feel very confident that I'm doing my due diligence in making decisions about what's gonna happen for the person that I'm working with based on evidence and not based on just what I think. Um, so again, this, this is part of the responsibility. Um, there's also a principle in ABA of least restrictive procedures. And it's a fancy way of saying, like, do the minimum intervention you can do to get the effect you need before you move to a more invasive or intensive intervention. Um, and, you know, so you hear about some of these procedures, particularly for challenging behavior, that are 
really intense and really, you know, sometimes can carry risk. Like when Liz was talking about that extinction burst, like if we're going to let a child go through behavior, for example, in order to reduce it, that carries risk. Um, and we're not necessarily going to use that strategy if we have a different strategy that carries less risk. So we're always engaging in that pro-con analysis or that sort of risk management framework and we're always going to start with our least restrictive and also then our most positive procedure before we move to something that's more challenging potentially. Um, one of the real keys to this is the partnership that is required between the therapist and the patient and family. Um, so this is what we, what we mean when we start talking about informed consent for assessment and treatment. So again, I think, you know, the idea that like, I've got a set of tools that I can use to change your behavior, like that can sound pretty onerous and, you know, scary and sinister, right? Um, but as a, as a therapist, I'm not going to use those tools to change your behavior without making sure that you're engaged in that process jointly with me. Um, so informed consent is literally what it sounds like. It is, you know, saying to a patient and to a family, this is what we've identified needs to be in your treatment plan. You need to work on these, you know, these goals, or we need to reduce these challenging behaviors. These are the strategies that we recommend, you know, be used to work on those skills or reduce those behaviors. These are the advantages of those strategies. These are the risks of those strategies. Let's talk about how that all sounds to you. In the mandate of informed consent is not just, I gave you the treatment plan or you signed the consent form. It's we have really had a dialogue where you have had an opportunity to ask questions and raise concerns and converse with me about what it is that we're about to embark upon. And we have a shared vision that this is what's appropriate for this, you know, for this individual or for this um, child and family. Um, so that is, that is a, a mandate of being a therapist of any kind, um, but it's taken very seriously by the field of ABA for the, the kinds of reasons that we're talking about. Um, and then the last one, which also does kind of relate to the least restrictive procedures one, is, you know, a lot of special consideration when we're using punishment procedures. Um, and some punishment procedures are pretty benign, right? I mean, if you clock me over the head with a train track, which has happened to me, I am going to take it from you. Trust me. I am not going to like that, and that is going to be the natural consequence for your behavior. And the goose egg that comes afterwards will make me never want to give you train tracks again. That's pretty benign, right? Or at least in theory. Now, it could have risk because if I take it from you knowing that you're going to break everything in the house and become extremely aggressive with me, well, again, then I have to consider, consider the use of that punishment procedure. But we'll assume it's more benign than some other procedures. Um, so, you know, we don't just use those types of procedures off the cuff without thinking about, again, the kind of the risk-benefit ratio, et cetera. And we are always going to start with the most positive procedure first. If we can use reinforcement, we're going to use it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, why wouldn't we? There would be no, there would be no drawback to that. Um, and, and we're going to really, you know, sort of consider does the severity or the danger of the behavior necessitate the use of a punishment procedure? So, you know, sometimes we get in this, in this kind of ethical quandary of like, well, this child is engaging in incredibly dangerous behavior. They're banging their head so hard on the table that they're going to the emergency department all the time. Or they're so aggressive with others that the, you know, the teacher and the parents have been assaulted. Well, the ethical mandate of, you know, of doing the least, uh, you know, the least amount of harm and the most amount of good, to leave that child untreated is actually far less ethical than to say, you know, we're out of other treatment options. We might have to use some, some treatment options that carry challenges, but to leave that child untreated is actually the least ethical thing to do, and we've got to have our, you know, our risk-benefit analysis have an appropriate ratio there. Um, now, again, the field takes this stuff very seriously. So there are recommendations, you know, in the ethical code about if you are using procedures that carry risk or if you are using procedures that you know will increase challenging behavior temporarily before it decreases, for example, you should be doing things like seeking increased supervision, seeking increased consultation, really weighing out your options carefully and documenting them, et cetera. Um, so I really think it's important to emphasize this because, 
the field does not take the responsibility lightly of you know using the tools that that are available to you know to work with individuals um, whether it's individuals with autism or any other you know kind of behavior change um, so since Liz kind of first talked about skills acquisition and then went on to challenging behavior we're going to kind of take this in the same order and we're going to talk a little bit about kind of past, present, and future of each of these areas and what some of the, you know, past challenges have been and what some of the progress has been and then, you know, kind of what where we hope the field goes next. Um, so, you know, we heard about some of the differences between structured interventions, more naturalistic interventions. You know, Liz did a really nice job of highlighting that there's pros and cons to both. And, you know, in our program, we certainly follow the philosophy that all types of interventions are tools in the toolbox. So, you know, you will definitely hear people say, well, we only do discrete trial teaching. Everything else is bad or doesn't work. Or we only do naturalistic intervention. Everything else doesn't work or is bad or what not developmentally appropriate. Um, and we don't have research to support any of those assertions. Um, what we have is, again, the evolution of a field that now leaves us at, you know, kind of a current state of we have many tools in the toolbox and still some more progress to make. Um, so in the past, there, were, there was not really so much focus on the more flexible and naturalistic kinds of interventions. The focus was really much more on the highly structured, more repetitive, kind of narrow interventions that we heard about. And those were the majority of the tools in the toolbox. Um, and you can imagine there are situations where that might not be ideal for every behavior for every kid. Um, and there were kind of side effects, if you will, like decreases in motivation or challenging behavior, some of the things we heard about. But the early research on this, you know, in this area demonstrated that these procedures worked to teach people with ASD skills that no one had previously taught them before. So let me repeat that because it's incredibly important. No one had previously taught these skills to people with ASD before. So these were, these were individual, individuals that were deemed unteachable, uneducable. That's horrifying to me. When you, when you think about an entire population of individuals being essentially written off, including by the public education system. I mean, under, under special education law at that time, these individuals were sort of deemed a lost cause, essentially. And, and the early behavior analysts who made some of these discoveries were actually incredible advocates for these individuals. The early behavior analysts got these individuals out into the community, they taught them job skills, they, they gave them increased functionality and quality of life and meaning, and, and this was a breakthrough. This was, you know, in the, in the 70s and in the early 80s, these were really monumental breakthroughs. Um, so were there some drawbacks to those early approaches? Yeah, like did kids get bored? Yes, you know? Um, I mean, you ask parents of adult kids now and they're like, yeah, it was, you know, it was repetitive. It was hard to hang in there sometimes. But my kid talks now, you know? My adult is verbal and they became verbal in ABA, for example. Um, so, you know, although there were some drawbacks to that past, there were many, many advantages. Um, now the good news is, is we've progressed, right? We, I mean, if, if the science is science, then it's going to progress. So where we've come to now is we have many more tools in the toolbox. We've got this nice continuum that Liz was talking about from the more structured approaches when we need them to the very naturalistic approaches when we can use them. Um, and we've got a lot of you know, approaches in between and we've got lots of flexibility to combine this approach with that approach and do what we think is clinically appropriate for an individual to teach a specific behavior. Um, we also have a lot more focus on developmentally appropriate approaches. So, you know, we did used to put very young kids in chairs at tables and try to work with them in this discrete trial fashion because that was the tool we had. And those kids gained skills, but there were drawbacks for that, right? Two-year-olds don't sit in chairs. Not any two-year-olds I know. Um, and, and, and now we have a much greater ability to flexibly apply these kinds of strategies across, the, you know, both the age range but also the range of developmental levels. Um, 
And we have a really nice significant body of research to support this flexible application of ABA principles. Um, so again, when people tell you, you know, there are definitely people who have a philosophy of ABA. You know, my philosophy of ABA is discrete trials, or my philosophy of ABA is naturalistic. And, and I will, again, repeat, the literature doesn't support the superiority of one approach over another. What the literature supports is that these approaches all do result in skill acquisition. So if someone has a preference, that's exactly what it is, is their preference or their philosophy. But that is not actually supported by data that, or research that compares these models. Um, so, you know, and, and I think one of the other things that's really salient is, again, we took a, a group of individuals who were you know, essentially deemed individuals who couldn't learn, and suddenly these things are considered rights. It's not like, oh, you'll get therapy if you can get access or if you're lucky. No, special education is a right, and there are mandates for access to things like ABA through insurance. Um, so what was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, sort of a pioneered, uh, an early, you know, a field in its early pioneering days is now a right and a mandate, um, and that's really significant progress. So where do we go with skills acquisition? So I think we're at a super cool place in the field of ABA in terms of skills acquisition um, because we've got really a lot of research to support all kinds of great tools. And now we get to just like dig in and, you know, continue to fine tune these things and develop new strategies and combine them in new ways and try this strategy for that behavior that it's never been applied to before. And, you know, we have so much depth now of empirical support. Now we get to start answering some really cool and interesting questions. Like the behavior analysts, we can all, you know, sort of nerd out on this stuff. We start diving into our data and we get really excited and happy. But it also has important meaning, right, for individuals who are receiving treatment. Um, because it means that our ability to really start engaging in a much more precise way of applying these principles, you know, this child learns best in this way, or, you know, we know that kids with these characteristics, you know, tend to learn better with this type of strategy. That allows us to really start to individualize much more than we did in the past. Um, so, you know, I think one of the really cool questions is this third point. Um, we can start to ask questions about characteristics of, of people, you know, kids that predict which treatments might be the best for them. You know, so the child is nonverbal. Let's, let's compare a group of nonverbal kids who got this treatment and a group of nonverbal kids who got that treatment and compare their responses and try to have, so we know all the treatments will work, so nobody will be stuck in a placebo group where they won't be getting treatment, but like, can we start to really have some differentiated ways of saying a child with this profile might benefit from these treatments, you know, first, and so let's start there and then continue to develop it. So predictors of treatment response is our, our fancy, you know, research lingo for that, but really what it means is which treatments are tools for which individuals and for which behavior. So that's research that has not been done, that is going to be fascinating and is really going to add to the field. Um, and, you know, I think one of the other things that we really need is it's been a fight getting insurance coverage for this stuff, right? It has been a fight. I don't have to tell all of you guys because you've lived it. It has been a fight. Um, and, the, and the fight is not over to get insurance coverage for these kinds of treatments. And so we really need more robust research methodology that insurance companies are going to recognize um, so, that, so that they aren't stuck in the position of kind of questioning the history of the research methodology. Um, and so what we don't have a ton of in ABA, we, we're starting to have some, but we don't have a ton of randomized controlled trials. And I won't bore you with the details if that's, if that's not a familiar term to you. But it's, a, it's considered the gold standard or the most rigorous way to test any medical treatment. Um, and a little bit of that has been done in our field, but not a lot. So that's a really exciting next step in terms of um, skills acquisition. So when we're talking about addressing challenging behavior, so again, we'll go back to the past. Um, again, the earliest forms of interventions for challenging behavior primar primarily relied on highly structured approaches, especially in assessment, and most of that occurred in clinical or research settings. 
you know, there was, there was not a lot of, or not as much going out into the natural environment and operating in the community. It was much more about how do we demonstrate you know, that we can change this behavior by changing this variable in the laboratory setting. Um, so that had, you know, a lot of limitations to it. Um, and there is definitely a history in the field of ABA of using aversive approaches. So, you know, things like punishment, like we have talked about. Um, and these approaches were used because research demonstrated their effectiveness. Again, it wasn't because someone woke up one day and was in a bad mood and wanted to, you know, have a negative intervention. It was because research demonstrated that these things worked. Um, and again, it was the first time that anybody had decreased some of these severe behaviors. You know, we had a, a, a history of especially adults with a significant level of impairment with severe self-injurious behavior and aggressive behavior, a lot of them in institutions, minimal quality of life, minimal meaning in their lives, et cetera, no functional skills, and nobody who had figured out how to reduce those behaviors and increase these people's quality of lives. So again, this was a huge breakthrough. Um, I mean, if you've been in the field long enough, I, I have seen some astonishing videos of adults who had gone years without any intervention for their self-injury, for example, and who then, through these procedures of applied behavior analysis, had a significant reduction in their self-injury. And, and again, there's that risk, that cost-benefit ratio, or that risk analysis, right? How are we, what procedures are we needing to use to decrease that self-injury? But if you're gonna get yourself in the hospital because you're engaging that behavior, that is absolutely part of our risk analysis. Um, so, and you know, so again, these individuals who previously did a lot of very significant harm to themselves and other people made progress. And that was the first time that had ever happened. Um, so then when we come up to the present, we, again, we have a lot more tools now. You know, this allowed us to say, okay, this stuff works, but we, how do we fine tune it? How do we use positive approaches whenever we can? How do we minimize the use of punishment? Minimize the, you know, the use of any kind of aversive procedures? Um, and as we started to make progress, the field started to call for a reduction in you know, the use of punishment strategies and aversive procedures. And so this is where you know, the current ethics code, for example, really reflects that. Um, the, the, the providers of ABA were no more satisfied with the use of those procedures than, you know, anybody else who might view that negatively. Um, but if that was our only tool, when you weigh it out, sometimes that was the, you know, the way that we had to go. So we now have many more strategies um, and, you know, again, many more sort of tools in the toolbox. We also have a lot more um, sophistication in our assessment strategies. So that allows us to, you know, we heard from Liz about that functional assessment process. Um, the tools that are involved in that allow us now to have a much more detailed analysis and to understand complex situations and situations that have multiple functions or, you know, it's not uncommon for there to be sequential functions, like the behavior starts for this reason and then the function shifts as over the course of the episode. Or, so there's a lot of layers to peel back, right? A lot of complexity there. And our assessment tools have improved a lot for doing that. Um, but, you know, no question, this work is still hard. Um, you know, the behaviors being treated are severe oftentimes. They're dangerous oftentimes. Um, and so we still have a lot of ethical considerations that we have to really be thoughtful about. This, you know, this work has gotten more sophisticated and it has improved, but it's not easy work. Um, and it won't ever be easy work because of the nature of the kinds of, of behaviors that we're targeting. So where do we think we're going to go in the field of challenging behavior? Um, again, we, there's so much more room for continuing to develop more tools. And one of the things that I think has been really cool in, you know, kind of more of the recent literature in challenging behavior is the assessment methodology is really getting very sophisticated. There's, there used to be like one or two methods for assessing function of behavior. Now there are many methods. There's many different ways to gather this information. There's many different ways to observe the variables that you're trying to observe or try things out and see what the effect is. Um, and some of those are, again, really nuanced, like very, very useful tools that we now have. Um, I think we have a, a much broader focus and we're gonna continue to have even more, you know, a continued broadening of our focus in terms of generalization. 
outside of clinical and research settings. Um, we do have a lot of challenges in the field still where, you know, again, this work takes a high level of training. This work takes a high level of expertise. Not every behavior analyst graduates graduate school with the skill set to do this work. Um, and so oftentimes, it, you know, these services remain isolated to specialty care clinics and specific providers, and they're not always readily available um, because it's not just a matter of finding a behavior analyst or a behavior therapist. It's a matter of finding one who has the skill set to do this work. Um, and so, you know, I think we just really need kind of an ongoing focus on, you know, people who are out there in the community who can really help us to take these services outside of clinical and research settings and into community-based settings. Um, so that's a, a, you know, it's a generalization issue for the patient, but it's a dissemination and training issue for the field. Um, and so this is a big, a big focus. Same thing as the other one, you know, predictors of treatment response. Every, you know, kid with X behavior is not going to benefit from the same approach to that behavior. So we need to really be looking at individual, you know, profiles and, and having a much more precise approach. And then, of course, ethical considerations are always going to remain a focus, in, you know, especially in this particular part of the field, um, because they're inherent in working with challenging behavior. There are risks when individuals are engaging in challenging behavior, and that's by definition. That has nothing to do with the treatment strategies being used. It, it's a result of the behavior. Um, and so, of course, there's going to be ongoing, you know, attention to those ethical considerations. So I want to kind of finish with also, you know, I want to, we've been, we've been very honed in on the field of ABA. I want us to actually finish by broadening our perspective, because I think this is also, um, you know, kind of an area where it, it's, it's easy for people to feel like ABA is the only field that has these challenges or, you know, like we're the first ones who thought of these challenges. Um, and in fact, all therapy is, is, carries risk, right? It's, in the field of psychology, informed consent is one of the very first ethical principles. If you're going to sit with someone in a room as a psychologist and, you know, ask them to pour their heart out to you or talk about their trauma or, you know, target something that's really challenging for them, that carries inherent risks, um, much like any medical intervention would. So these, you know, kind of ethical type concerns and these risk-benefit analyses, these are not unique to the field of ABA. Um, and I think sometimes we get focused so inward that we sort of forget, like there, you know, the field of medicine, for example, has a very long history that we can draw upon of how we think about and address these kinds of issues. You know, if you have, if you need a heart transplant, how do you consider the, you know, the risks and the benefits of that? If you need chemo, how do you consider the risks and the benefits of that? Um, and, and, and there's many, many years of thought and, and, you know, discovery that have gone into some really robust principles for how we think about these things across all of medicine and mental health. Um, so, you know, so I think we, uh, having, a, having that perspective that this is not unique to ABA is useful. Um, and I want to highlight a couple of examples for you guys from um, the, the, you know, sort of broader field of psychology, um, because these types of therapies have come under some of the same types of criticism that ABA has come under. Um, they've just been around for longer, so some of that is, you know, a little bit more water under the bridge in some of these other fields. Um, so, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, which people may or may not be familiar with, but it takes a lot of the components of ABA and then adds in additional components that have to do with how our thoughts and how our feelings affect how we behave and what we do and how we're functioning. Um, and there's a, there are several kinds of cognitive behavioral therapy specifically that have some similar kinds of characteristics that we can sort of use for, you know, in an analogous way. So exposure and response prevention is a treatment for um, obsessive compulsive disorder, fears and phobias um, that has come, over, come under lots of scrutiny over the years. So it was called in 2003 in a New York Times Magazine article, The Cruelest Cure. Sounds very ominous, right? Um, and, and what exposure and response prevention does is it says, okay, you're scared of germs. We are going to make a hierarchy of all kinds of situations that involve germs, from easy ones that you can pretty much tolerate to something you cannot imagine. And then we are going to have you work through that hierarchy and actually practice exposing yourself to those things. And we are not going to allow you to avoid it. 
Because what we know, again, based on many, many years of research, is that if you do that, eventually your responses, your anxiety responses, both the physical responses, like a racing heart or sweating, but also the psychological responses will habituate. They will decrease because your, your body and your mind will find out that actually when I touch the trash can, nothing terrible happens. And if you do that enough times, you stop having the response, right? And so, so this is hard. This is hard work. Like, you guys tell me, who, who would want to be, you know, thrown into a pit of snakes? Raise your hand if you would like that. I would not, right? We wouldn't actually do that because that's not something you need to be able to do to function in life. But if you can't even hear the word snake, then that could be a problem, right? I mean, if you have a panic attack, every time someone says the word snake, that could impair you functionally. Um, so this is hard, right? But what we know, again, based on research, many, many years of research, is that it works. Um, Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is another example. Um, and this is another population that really struggled to have success in therapy. Trauma survivors, you know, rape victims, people with PTSD, people who were victims of violence, veterans. Um, these are hard things to overcome, right? Um, and one of the things that we know, just like in exposure and response prevention, is if you don't avoid your trauma, if you face it essentially kind of head on, your anxiety response will habituate to the trauma the same way as it will habituate if you touch a trash can and you have a phobia of germs. Um, so some of these types of interventions, again, can be really challenging. I mean, I have seen videos of people doing cognitive behavioral therapy for trauma where like a rape victim, for example, was in excruciating detail replaying verbally for the therapist every detail of the trauma, every detail of the event. And what they do in that situation is they develop what's called a trauma narrative where, you know, there's a, essentially there's a story that's developed from the person's perspective of what happened. And then they continuously, continuously, continuously fine tune and hone but review the trauma narrative until it's no longer traumatic for you. Now that doesn't sound easy, right? That sounds incredibly hard. Um, so, so there are many, I, I highlight these examples because they're very stark. They're very, you know, they illustrate these points very well. Um, but in the field of psychology and in the field of medicine, again, we have this much broader context for some of the challenges that can be associated with doing the hard work of behavior change, essentially. Um, so to kind of wrap it all up, because we're definitely getting near, our, near the end of our time. To wrap up Liz's part, you know, it can be summed up in this first point. All ABA is is the science of behavior change, right? It's learning theory. It's how we can get people to change their behavior. It's a teaching methodology. Um, and behavior change is never easy and it's never risk-free. And that's true in ABA as well as in any other type of therapy. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, the field has a very significant focus on the ethics and the responsibility that's associated with being in that role as a therapist. Um, so like I've mentioned a, a whole bunch of times, kind of that pro and con or that risk benefit, you know, ratio of the treatment approach versus not treating at all is always at the core of, you know, everything that we do when we're treatment planning. Um, and I think most importantly, I don't have it up on this slide actually, most importantly, it's always done in partnership with the patient and the family. The patient certainly has to have certain capabilities to do that, and that's variable depending on age and developmental level. But in the case that they don't have the ability, then it's done in conjunction with the family. Um, and that informed consent and that focus on a partnership and a team approach and agreement that this is what we're going to do is of paramount importance. So I think we have about somewhere between 7 and 12 minutes for questions. Let's do it. So we have a question in the back. And I'm going to repeat the questions so that the online users can hear them. Um, certainly, I think one of the other challenges of ABA is making it accessible for people. Yes. I have a child who has been diagnosed with ABA. We're on every wait list in yes. the greater Seattle area, and they're still telling me, oh, if you want an app that's full of time, we have to wait six, to, six months to three years. Um, the ABA therapists are not allowed in the school. Yes. To help with those school vacations that need help. Um, I need to maintain my job. Right. Once I have 
appointment. Yeah. So I'm going to be taking him back and forth to ABA appointments. Yeah. And I'm, I'm asking for home therapy. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So let me repeat the question first. And then we have the expertise of Arzu in the room. So I'm going to partially answer it. But I'm Arzu, do you mind also chiming in about the school part? Because I saw you kind of perk right up on that. And I think you're more up to date on the school part than I am. So... Um, but for the online viewers, so the question is about how do we increase ABA access? Um, how do we, you know, grapple with the fact that there are not enough providers? There are very long waiting lists. Kids are in school, and if you want to have an after-school slot or if a parent has to work, how do we coordinate all this stuff? Am I capturing all the? Yeah. Okay. So and, and and so the question is is what's happening in the field to try to improve those issues? Um, so, so one thing that I would say um, is, is happening is the field of ABA is growing at a, at a very rapid pace. So training programs are, you know, popping up all over the place. Training programs are growing. There are more online training programs. Um, so just in general, I think the, you know, the, the field realizes, it's not lost on the field, that, that these are real challenges. And the field is really responding to that. Um, but that's like for the next generation of kids. It's not for the kid who's sitting on the waiting list now, right? Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that we work with families a lot on, and you sound like you're a pretty good advocate, but this is part of my answer as well for, for other folks. We work a lot with families on the advocacy part of it because a lot of times, you know, you might be on 10 waiting lists, but if you're the person who, if you're not, if you're not a person who's calling back regularly, checking in, everybody's so inundated that kids are falling off the radar and getting lost in the shuffle. And um, so any parent that's here or listening, you know, be the parent who calls every other week. Be the parent who makes sure that your kid is on the waiting list still. Be the parent who has your kid on 10 waiting lists. Like you're providing a great example for, you know, for parents who aren't as far along in this process as you are because the advocacy does definitely make a difference. Um, the school piece is huge. Arzu, do you mind giving us an update on the status of ABA being delivered in the schools in Washington? I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. And if you come here, you'll be actually on the uh, video screen. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. It, right now, it's really hard for school districts to hire behavior analysts as employees to work in, um, within schools However, there are efforts underway to credential behavior analysts as ESAs so that they would be employed in school districts as, um, in the same way as school psychologists, as speech and language pathologists, as occupational therapists, so that behavior analysts could be employed and work with students in schools. This effort is underway and on track, and we hope to see it um, in place by September. So, yeah. yeah. So this legislative session is working through the session very well. The other thing for you to be mindful of is there's a difference between medically necessary ABA and services that are provided to a student under the IDEA. And so if you're trying to get access to medically necessary ABA and you're on a waiting list because of your insurance company not having enough people within your network, contact us offline and we'll work with you to see if we can get your provider, your insurance company to expand their network so that you're not facing this long waiting list. Yeah. Oh, Washington Autism Alliance and Advocacy. Yeah. So if you're in limbo and just on this waiting list, it yes. sounds like you were saying cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of the closest to ABA. Is that maybe worth trying to a cognitive behavioral therapist while you're waiting for an ABA slot? Yeah, that's a good or question. Another form of therapy that might be helpful. Right. Um, so the question, so the question, just again for the viewers, is if cognitive behavioral therapy is sort of the close cousin of ABA, if you will, would that be worth trying? Uh, while you're waiting for ABA, and unfortunately, the answer is a, is a clear as mud kind of answer. It depends. Yeah, because although you know a lot of the principles are very similar, cognitive behavioral therapy is is not equipped to handle the skill instruction and the reduction of challenging behaviors at the level that is oftentimes needed. 
And so it really would depend on what kinds of things you might be working on. Like if we're working on something like um, self-monitoring your social behavior, let's say, and you know that the child needs to learn how to understand, um, I need to be able to monitor how I'm interacting with others and monitor you know, this set of cues, social cues coming from them, and be aware that I'm doing a good job and control my impulses and not blurt out or, you know, like those kinds of things are actually pretty closely aligned with a lot of strategies used in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but if the child needs to learn toilet training and dressing and basic functional communication and reduction of significant challenging behaviors, cognitive behavioral therapy isn't going to come close. That therapist is going to tell you in the first visit they don't have the skill set. Um, so it's, it's really going to depend on the treatment targets. And so a lot of times what we, you know, what we recommend while you're waiting, um, there's a couple things. I mean, one is can you get, I mean, you've, you guys have seen today, like a lot of these principles are not overly complicated, right? Like some parts of this are pretty complicated and pretty nuanced and pretty challenging. But some of the basics of like how do we teach a basic skill? How do we reinforce behavior in the natural environment is not that complicated. And so parents can, to a certain extent, pick up some books and some resources and start doing some reading on how do I teach this skill um, and do that with some reasonable effect if we're not talking about highly specialized needs. Um, so, so, you know, kind of trusting yourself to have a sense for what your child needs and in getting some resources, you know, that, that might guide you on how you could start approaching that would definitely be a reasonable thing to try. Um, the other thing that, that we're seeing a little bit and, you know, some agencies might tell you you're crazy if you ask them this question, but we're seeing it a little in the, in the field and especially in Washington is, you know, this problem of lack of access to care really go, ends up sort of falling back on the shoulders of the insurance companies. Because if an insurance company is mandated by Washington state law to provide you with ABA, they can't use the excuse that they don't have a provider. If they, if they don't have a provider for you, they're obligated to try to, to get one for you if they're governed by Washington state law, which is, there's a lot of nuances there. But, but so what some agencies are doing in that context to, to help out, and insurance is paying for it because it is their mandate, is doing things like short-term parent training programs for parents who are waiting. Um, so, you know, they might say, okay, we're going to have you come in for three sessions, six sessions, 12 sessions of one-to-one -one parent training or group parent training. And this is by no means your like comprehensive treatment plan, but this is something for you in the meantime. Um, and so that's not an unreasonable question to start asking agencies is like, hey, while I'm waiting, do you guys offer anything less intensive or more just like parent education focus that I could be doing in the meantime? Um, so those are a few suggestions. Other questions in the room, or do we want to take an online question? I do. So we have, we have a couple. Okay. Um, so the first one is, what, this is from Zach. Okay. Uh, what kind of ethical oversight does the BACB use when it comes to judgment calls around least restrictive interventions? Ah, okay. So I'm going to repeat the question. So thank you, Zach. The question came from Zach Sadiq, um, who we do have some, we have up some personal relationships with him. He's a very active member of our community and advocate. Um, and the question is, what kinds of uh, ethical considerations, sorry, repeat the rest of it. Yep. What kinds of ethical oversight does the BACB use when it comes to judgment calls around least restrictive interventions? Okay. So what types of ethical oversight does the BACB, so that's that governing body, use when it comes to oversight of using least restrictive interventions? Yes. Okay. So I am actually going to give you, oh, I think your mic is actually on. So Liz is a BCBA. I am not certified by the BACB. So I have good working knowledge of the ethics code, but I'm going to turn that over to you if I can for just a minute, and then I might have a few thoughts to add. 
Um, so based upon our compliance code, um, part of that um, involves having supervision um, by other BCBAs who have more experience in the field, maybe um, have been around for a little bit longer. And so you often are developing partnerships with those people and are encouraged um, to be um, mentored by those individuals if you are going to look at taking on a case that's outside of your area of expertise, for example. Um, in addition to making sure that you're staying current on all of the um, literature that's out there that's been coming out, um, those are um, overseen by the BACB by making sure that there are CE events that you're attending, um, and specifically CE events that you're attending, that's continuing education events um, that are specific to ethics. So part of that means that not only are you learning about you know, new resources research in terms of new intervention strategies, but also making sure that you're staying up to date with those ethical practices. Um, and in many of those, they're sitting down and going through different case scenarios with you, talking about um, the types of decisions you're making. And if you're at a point where you're not sure, you should certainly be seeking supervision in those situations as well. Yeah. And a, a piece that I would add to that is, um, I mean, the, the BACB is an oversight board. So uh, a complaint can be filed with the BACB. Um, and then there is a whole body within that organization mm -hmm. who has the job of investigating those you know, types of complaints. So certainly, we hope that the behavior analysts in the field are conducting themselves in such a way that it doesn't get to that point. But that is a very direct way that the BACB would potentially have involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, you know, more and more in, in most states or in many states, practicing ABA without the appropriate credentials, which for the most part is the, B, the BCBA credential, is, is not legal. So many states are passing legislation or insurance mandates that you have to be credentialed in this way. So being sanctioned by the BACB is a very serious thing in the field. Um, or having your, you know, your BCBA revoked would be an incredibly serious thing. You can't continue practicing. So, you know, this is again, they're 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 not just sort of a an idealistic body that puts forth guidelines. Like they're they have jurisdiction. There is there's teeth in that process for sure. Sure. Well, what what are we supposed to? I think we start at seven twenty five. So, what is our stopping point supposed to be? Like, I don't want to hold people up if they're trying to. Should we go five more minutes? Is that we go five more? okay? Yeah. If anyone needs to go, please feel free to scoot on your way. Okay, so this question is from Natasha. If your focus is on measurable behavior change, do you have any way to monitor for causing an increase in internal internalizing symptoms such as anxiety or depression? Do you want me to repeat that again? Yes. Yes. If your focus is on here, I have a better idea. I'm gonna give you the mic so you can read it for the. Oh, perfect. And we'll have it verbatim. So this mess, this question came in from Natasha. If your focus is on measurable behavior change, do you have any way to monitor for causing an increase in internalizing symptoms such as anxiety or depression? Okay, that is a very good question. Um, I'll take a stab at this one, and if you want to add, you can. How about sure. that? We can take okay. turns. Sure. Um, so, what do you think I'm going to say? It depends, right? <laughs> um, certainly, there are many, many people who are clients or patients in ABA therapy who have a very good ability to report on these things. Um, and it is definitely not to say that because that's not the behavior we were measuring that we're going to disregard that information. Um, that would absolutely be relevant information. Um, and, and if we were receiving that information, we would absolutely be working, again, in a you know, team-like fashion um, with the patient or with the family to determine, again, what are the risks and what are the benefits? Like, you're experiencing distress. That's a risk. The benefit is we're going to change your behavior in this way. Is that, you know, consistent or is, are, we, are we out of whack in our risk-benefit analysis? Are you experiencing so much distress that this is not tolerable and it's not worth the behavior change that we're trying to accomplish. So, so it's not at all to say that we would disregard that data. Um, I think for individuals who are more impaired, it's more challenging, right? And, and by definition, autism is a disorder of social communication, which comes along with, of course, not being able to verbalize necessarily your internal state. 
but also not actually being very aware of your internal state. I mean, impairments in emotional awareness and emotional regulation are part of autism. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we can't rely upon those kinds of things. And so then we have to really work with people who know that person well to identify whether, you know, behaviors that they're exhibiting are kind of signs and symptoms of distress or of, you know, something that's becoming intolerable. So we might be working with a family or a caregiver or a, you know, a team of folks who know that individual well and can, again, help us to make that assessment and help us to understand our kind of risk-benefit ratio and decide whether we're going to proceed. Um, and, and again, we wouldn't disregard those impressions. We would work to sort of reconcile that situation and have a treatment plan that everyone could feel like was appropriate. Uh, would you add anything yeah. to that? Um, I would just say in addition to that, when we're talking about like operational definitions of behaviors, there are some situations where we might be able to help do that with a child or an individual that has, you know, the cognitive capacity um, to be able to maybe show that to us on some sort of rating scale or depict mm -hmm. it by, you know, some kind of number so that we can have a little bit better of a way of trying to define that mm -hmm. um, in a more um, objective manner. Mm -hmm. And in a manner that doesn't require as much sophistication in your social communication. Mm -hmm. If you can point to a picture of where you're at or pick a number or a color that's associated with like your, you know, your mm -hmm. emotional state, sometimes individuals who are less able to articulate that can give us a lot of information. Um, and actually in cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, when we were talking about exposure therapy, having people make a rating of their distress is part of how the intervention gets planned. So there is a, a, a scale that people use in cognitive behavioral therapy. They refer to it as SUDS, which stands for Subjective Units of Distress. Um, and it's, a, it's a, essentially just what Liz is saying. It's a way of kind of putting a numeric rating or some kind of a scale to how much distress are you going to experience when I make you touch the trash can. Um, and we don't start with a 10 out of 10, right? We, the, the whole point is, is we work up the hierarchy. We say, okay, we're going to start with a two out of 10 and get you really good at that. And then we're going to go to a four, to a six. And, 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 five, and what, by the time we get to 10, that is probably not a 10 anymore because you've made so much progress in treatment that your biggest fear is maybe only a five now. Um, and we would do the same kinds of things when we're, you know, using ABA interventions. We're not going to just start with like, total cold turkey, remove the reinforcer, even though we know you're going to, you know, completely go through the roof. We're going to, we have all kinds of analyses that we're going to do of all the teeny tiny baby steps, and all the gradations of how we can work up to this skill or fade out the adult support. Um, and so it's, it's a thousand shades of gray in, in most cases. It's not black and white. Um, and in that way, we can avoid a lot of that distress. Um, so that's, that's a really good question. Okay. Well, does anyone in the, else in the room have any other questions? Well, to follow up, it sounds like it's when you're, when you're treating depression and anxiety, some initial investment in coming up with a scale or teaching the child or adult to express emotion is fundamental. It's certainly very, very helpful. I mean, it's fundamental if you can do it. Um, and in autism, one of the things that we, you know, we spend lots of time thinking about in like the broader field of autism treatment is, you know, many individuals with autism really struggle with that. Um, and so we make all kinds of adaptations to the traditional ways that these therapies are, are implemented. So for example, in cognitive behavioral therapies for anxiety, there's now a, a much more robust body of literature supporting versions of those interventions that have been around for a long time that are adapted in ways that are more suitable for individuals with autism. So, you know, how we make those, those types of, um, you know, ratings more visual and more concrete and how we adapt language and take out jargon. And um, so, it, yeah, there's, a, there's quite a bit in the way of adaptations. All right. So, last one. Uh, get the mic. Okay. So, this one, and um, hopefully I am not messing up this name, but my apologies if I do. Um, this is from McKee Murmar. Is there a tool to distinguish whether a kid would benefit more on the OT versus ABA? Oh, okay. You want to take this one? 
Um, well, I think it's going, you know, obviously certain, you know, this is going to be a theme that this is going to be dependent on an individual. Okay. Um, and, and oftentimes if we're looking at something like occupational therapy, we might be doing that in conjunction and collaboration. So that's going to require that we're looking at multiple assessments in order to determine um, what's really going to be helpful for, helpful for the child um, and perhaps looking at using both approaches. I think one thing that we can do um, as behavior analysts, although um, you know we don't have the expertise in occupational therapy and the training that they undergo, one thing that we do have that could be potentially helpful in that situation is using a really good system for implementing interventions, helping to collect the data around that, and helping the team to then assess whether or not something um, is working or not. Good questions. Yeah, the online community is cracking tonight. Sometimes it's like crickets out there, you know? But yeah, this is, yeah, Arzu. I dovetail on your response, which was excellent. Here, I'm going to give you the mic so the online users can hear you. That was an excellent um, comment on that question, but I also wanted to say that depending on the goals of the therapy, occupational therapists sometimes work on sensory issues and mm -hmm. sensory difficulties, um, much like what you were describing in cognitive behavior therapy and on how you... Um, approach something that's very difficult. Occupational therapists also work in helping children overcome sensory difficulties, but they also work with um, certain fine motor difficulties mm -hmm. that um, would be helpful to a behavior analyst to work with an occupational therapist so that they can co-treat. <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that co-treat is, I mean, that goes back to, Liz, your point from the very beginning of your mm -hmm. presentation. Like, as behavior analysts, you know, we don't ever assume that we're working in a vacuum. You know, these are, are usually individuals that have comprehensive needs, and there's a lot of, you know, different s skill sets or sets of expertise that can potentially be really beneficial, whether it's occupational therapy, whether it's speech therapy, whether it's educators. Um, or specialists in ABA, and so yeah, the more we can be, do, like you're saying, doing those co-treats, oftentimes the better. Yeah. Okay, thank you, you guys. You were supposed yeah, to be out you. of here so long ago. <laughs> we really appreciate it.